As I said, my name is Ben Tuliger, and uh, I'm the executive director of the museum. And tonight's program is Eudora, Kansas in the Civil War. In the summer of 2011, only a few months before, after I started working here at the Historical Society, the first exhibit I ever made for the museum was called Eudora, Kansas in the Civil War. The exhibit is still on display at the museum today. I made the exhibit for two reasons. Firstly, the museum did not have any mention of the Civil War in Eudora, so I figured that needed to change. And secondly, I made the exhibit because 2011 was the sesquicentennial of the start of the Civil War. And so there was a lot of promotions for the Civil War going on in Douglas County at the time, including with the Watkins Museum. In the fall of 2011, I adapted the research I did for that exhibit, and I turned it into an essay for one of my classes at KU. And the presentation I'm about to make is largely the same as the final essay that I ever wrote as a graduate student at KU, which was in December of 2011. It was from my history course titled History and Pop Culture of Kansas, which was taught by the uh, very talented Civil War historian, Dr. Jonathan Earle. Uh, during my time at KU, the main topic I researched was Bleeding Kansas, so this is a familiar topic to me. I gave this presentation at the museum, or to the membership in 2013, I believe, but I've made a lot of updates and changes, so it's, I think it's fairly different today. And I've also given this at several other groups around the, the region. So this presentation is not only a presentation about the Civil War in Eudora, but it's also a presentation somewhat about the historiography of Bleeding Kansas as it relates to Eudora. And I'm sure a few of you know what historiography is, but to summarize for those who aren't familiar with it, historiography is the history of history. Historiography is the study of the methodology used to study history. Historiography is what most historians typically research and write about. Uh, using Bleeding Kansas as an example, the historiography of Bleeding Kansas studies how different historians interpreted the events of Bleeding Kansas over the years. Historians try to use the facts and historical events to frame certain arguments and viewpoints of those respective events. Uh, in the 1870s, when the first books were written on Bleeding Kansas, up until probably the 1960s, almost all of the works on Bleeding Kansas only placed emphasis on the, quote, great white men of the era, including people like John Brown. <clears throat> Furthermore, these works tended to overemphasize the anti-slavery abolitionist perspective while ignoring or downplaying the role of moderate free staters and the pro-slavery partisans in Kansas. Recent historians have attempted to debunk some of the myths of leading Kansas while incorporating social history and other fields of historical analysis to the subject. I consider myself a social historian. And I'm using kind of a famous example here. That's one of the most famous paintings in Kansas. That's Tragic Prelude by John Stuart Curry, which is at the Capitol. And the mural depicts a militant abolitionist, John Brown, clutching a Bible and a gun in each of his bloodied hands. The oversized Brown is in the middle of a clash between pro-slavery partisans and anti-slavery partisans during the Bleeding Kansas era. Bleeding Kansas was not just John Brown. It was so much more complex than John Brown. But early historians wrote mostly about John Brown or Abraham Lincoln. And recent historians have added much more to the topic. And the historiography of Bleeding Kansas, I think, has grown more diverse and um, far more interesting. The Civil War is perhaps the defining event in American history. The war between the states for once and for all settled the questions of slavery and union. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 and the events that occurred in the Kansas Territory, known as Bleeding Kansas, proved incredibly influential in the run-up to the war. Douglas County was the center of the debate over the expansion of slavery in the territory. Uh, this is a, pictured as a map of Douglas County in 1857, uh, when, when Kansas was still a territory. Every community in Douglas County witnessed passionate debate, violence, and terror as a result of slavery. And Eudora was no exception. Eudora's role in Bleeding Kansas in the Civil War is typically overshadowed by the nearby communities of Lawrence and Lecompton. However, residents of Eudora influenced the development of Bleeding Kansas and the Civil War, sacrificed for the Union cause, and were heavily impacted by the events. I think, as we all know, Eudora was founded by German immigrants in 1857. And unlike other towns in Douglas County, Eudora was not established for political purposes. It was not founded to support or oppose slavery. The early residents of Eudora were overwhelmingly German. 86% of Eudora's first settlers were German ethnically. Eudora's early residents were generally considered free staters. They wanted to keep slavery out of Kansas, but they were not concerned with the national efforts to end slavery. 
In other words, the residents of Eudora were most like the residents of the Kansas Territory at the time. They were not radicals resorting to violence on either side of the issue. Eudora is indicative of most Kansas communities during Bleeding Kansas and the Civil War. Therefore, the role of Eudora in Bleeding Kansas and the Civil War can be used as a case study uh, of represent, representing other moderate free state towns in Kansas. Before Eudora was established in 1857, there was an abolitionist presence in the region. Abraham Still, who's pictured there, was a Methodist minister and a medical doctor, and his family were among the first white Americans to sell Eudora in 1850. Still established the Wakarusa Mission, which is a picture there. That's just an artistic rendition. There's no photos, of course, of that mission, uh, which served the local Shawnee Indians. The Wakarusa Mission was located at what is now 12th and Elm Street in Eudora, although nothing remains from the mission. The mission was surrounded by 100 acres of cropland and several outbuildings. Abraham Still was noted for his abolitionist beliefs and his efforts to stop the Western spread of slavery. The mission ceased operations in 1854. Several sources claim the mission was abandoned because of pro-slavery hostility to Abraham Still because of his free state precepts and lack of government aid. Some Stills remained in the Eudora area after the Civil War and became prominent members of the community. The Stills are most famous today, I think, as pioneers in the field of osteopathy. There's a school in Kirks Kirksville, Missouri called the A.T. Still University, which specializes in osteopathy. <coughs> Eudora was not founded for political purposes, but some communities in the Eudora Township were founded partly for political purposes. The community of Hesper was established also in the 1850s, just a few miles south of Eudora. Hesper was founded by passionately anti-slavery Quakers. Local historians claim the early settlers to Hesper were against slavery and hoped to keep Kansas territory free. These early Quakers moved into various areas of eastern Kansas and soon started several friends meetings. Hesper was an exception in the Eudora Township, as it was the only community with political beginnings. Eudora and all other communities in the Eudora area were not founded uh, to further or hinder the expansion of slavery. The eastern portions of Douglas County were the last areas of the county to remain in the possession of the Shawnee Indians. The Shawnee tribe continued to live in the eastern portions of the county until 1857. Uh, three years after Lawrence and Lecompton had been settled. In 1857, representatives from a German immigrant company uh, in Chicago visited the Shawnee lands and searched for a site to establish a new community. Of course, we all know this story. They negotiated the purchasing of the lands from Pascal Fish, which that's a statue right there, which we don't, as far as I know, have any photos of, of that man. That's kind of like the, the one thing I'd really like to find more than anything is a photo of Pascal Fish, but I'm not sure one exists. Um, we do have one of Eudora and his daughter, but I've never seen one of Pascal. Chief Fish was purportedly very generous and sold the land to the German immigrants. And so the story goes, to show their gratitude, they named the community after his daughter. Uh, according to one of the, the Eudora Centennial, which was the first history book really published in Eudora in 1957, Eudora was established in a relatively peaceful time or in, quote, a lull between pro and anti-slavery warfare after the chaotic year of 1856. The early settlers to Eudora stood in contrast to other communities in Douglas County. Communities like Lecompton were established by Southerners who held conservative views on slavery. It was the goal of Lecompton to spread slavery into Kansas. Lawrence, on the other hand, was founded by Northerners who held liberal views on slavery and wanted to keep slavery out of Kansas. In contrast to both Lawrence and Lecompton, the early settlers of Eudora were overwhelmingly German, so they tended to not have a dog in that fight, so to speak. The Germans that settled Eudora tended to be from the more conservative Catholic regions of southern Germany, namely Bavaria. Conservative by nature, most Eudorans were unwilling to press for radical changes of any kind, including changes with regard to the institution of slavery, as it existed in the 1850s. As a result of the heavy German influence in Eudora, the community was far less involved in the intense political debates of the region. The Eudora Centennial notes, and I love this quote, there is no record of Eudora being molested during the troubled times, for early settlers of the region were shrewd enough to stay out of trouble, which I think there's merit to this point that they were never molested, and perhaps they were shrewd enough to stay out of trouble. 
But I think it would be more accurate to say they just weren't that strongly invested in the debate one side or the other. As, as I mentioned, they're not from the north or from the south, they're from a completely different continent. They're walking into a, a fight that's been raging and they're kind of just on the sidelines of it, um, based on my interpretation. Pasco Fish's views on slavery uh, are very interesting and they were quite similar to the views of the Eudora population as a whole. According to an article that was published in the Herald of Freedom in Lawrence, Kansas Territory, 1855, Pasco Fish delivered a speech in the anti-slavery stronghold of Lawrence on July 4, 1855. The speech was made two years before the establishment of Eudora. In the speech, Pasco welcomes the new white American settlers to Douglas County. He considers the new settlers friends and a welcome change. Pasco's speech was likely made after a variety of other speakers at the event condemned slavery because Pasco reportedly said, and this is his quote, the speeches which your chiefs have made so strong for freedom and opposed to slavery though I don't wish to say much on that subject, are right. I believe strongly as you the wickedness of slavery and the good which comes from freedom. So Pasco clearly believed slavery was wrong and the spread of slavery was wrong. However, he's unwilling to go into further detail on the subject in his speech. His unwillingness to go into detail is symbolic of his own views and the views of future Eudora residents. They oppose slavery and they especially oppose the slavery spreading into Kansas but they're not about to go out chopping people up like John Brown as a means to end slavery. Pasco Fish's views on slavery were similar really to the average Kansan at the time. Uh, Pasco, Eudora residents, and Kansas residents were not that political on the issue. Uh, while they opposed <coughs> Kansas becoming a slave state, there was also a large number of Kansans that opposed any black people at all moving into Kansas. So you can't necessarily say they were too progressive on the issue, uh, considering that. Uh, radicals like John Brown were very few in number when compared to the largely neutral population of Eudora in Kansas, which uh, brings me back to my argument that, um, you know, that the, where, lost my place, Radic uh, which again brings us back to the primary argument of this presentation. Well, that's a weird sentence. Ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going there. For a long period of time, the histories written on Bleeding Kansas made it seem like Kansas was filled with radicals on the issue of slavery. That most Kansas residents were radicals engaged in some kind of battle, militarily or politically, for the future of slavery. However, the most recent historical works on Bleeding Kansas proved this was not true. Only a select few people were battling on the issue in the 1850s, and most Kansans played no role in the debate on slavery. In addition to German settlers, Eudora had a substantial African-American community in its early years. The diversity of Eudora reflects the arguments of recent historians that territorial, that territorial Kansas was a complex society and home to many groups of people. In 1927, longtime Eudora <coughs> resident Susanna Gilmore, who first came to Eudora as a child in 1857, reflected on this diversity. Gilmore recalled seeing, quote, runaway slaves begging for food during the territorial years. Many records indicate that escaped or recently freed slaves from Missouri made Eudora their home during the early years of the community. African American families continued to move to Eudora for a decade after the Civil War. The 1865 census listed nearly 250 African Americans residing in Eudora Township, which was 25% of the township's population. The drought of uh, 1859 to 1860 was perhaps the most serious issue uh, that territorial Kansans faced. This severe drought impacted virtually all Kansas residents, including Eudora residents. The horrendous effects of this drought brought the failure of virtually all crops in Eudora. During the drought, it was difficult to obtain suitable food. Political concerns are always second to feeding one's family. Eudora residents were more preoccupied with their own survival during this crucial time than they were about the issue of slavery. In the 1850s, the opponents of slavery into Kansas began to triumph over the pro-slavery forces, politically and militarily. However, Kansas was not allowed to enter the Union as a free state in the late 1850s because of opposition from southern states and southern representatives. However, this would change. President Lincoln's uh, election, electoral victory in 1860 helped Kansas enter the Union as a free state because in 1860, when he won the election uh, opposing the spread of slavery into Kansas, which was one of the key issues of the election in 1860, uh, after he won, of course, a lot of southern states started to succeed opposing 
uh, President Lincoln. And once enough southern states had left, that's when Kansas was able to sneak in as a state because they could no longer block it. So Kansas entered the Union as a free state on January 29, 1861. Only a few months after Kansas became a state, the Civil War started. When the Civil War started in April of 1861, residents of the Eugenia <coughs> Township were quick to show their support for the Union. In April of 1861 alone, 80 men from the Eudora Township enlisted and formed Army units. In other words, one in four men in Eudora joined the war effort in the first month alone. Many more men enlisted in the following months and years. The initial population of Eudora was comprised mostly of German immigrants, and German, German immigrants, Irish immigrants, immigrants of all backgrounds uh, enlisted in the Union Army in very large numbers. Residents of all communities in eastern Kansas lived in fear and harassment from border ruffians from Missouri during the Civil War. The nearby communities of Olathe and Spring Hill were raided in 1862. Furthermore, Eudora's proximity to the abolitionist stronghold of Lawrence made the town vulnerable. While Eudora was never attacked by border ruffians, one can imagine the tension and fear they felt. In the event of an attack, Eudora residents believed they would be somewhat prepared. They used a small, quote, corn crib as a, quote, fort during the early 1860s. This quote, fort existed in downtown Eudora to the east of Main Street, between 7th and 8th Streets, right behind where the museum is today. This quote, unquote, fort could in theory protect the residents, but it was hardly an impregnable structure. Another source describes the fort as an old Indian fort built like a corn crib with long slots for guns. The most notable event in Douglas County during the entire Bleeding Kansas conflict and the Civil War was, of course, Quantrell's raid on, on Lawrence on August 21st, 1863. The deadly raid destroyed most of Lawrence and caused the murder of around 180 Lawrence residents. The Eudora area played a very direct role in the lead up to the raid and the rebuilding efforts after the raid. The response from Eudora area citizens to Quantrell's efforts are necessary to analyze considering Eudora's representation as an average moderate free state community and the importance of Quantrell's raid historically. There are some accounts that claim Quantrell visited Eudora prior to the raid on Lawrence. However, these accounts are very difficult to verify. No primary sources indicate that Quantrell visited Eudora before the raid. The most notable account claiming Quantrell visited Eudora prior to the raid is a 1903 article written by the Kansas City Star. The article claims that Quantrell and an associate visited a tavern in Eudora several weeks prior to the raid on August 21, 1863. According to the article, none of the white residents in Eudora recognized Quantrell. Instead, it was the black residents of the community who recognized him and left in terror. The white residents of Eudora became curious of the reaction of the black residents and eventually found out from them that it was Quantrell visiting the community. It seems suspicious to me that African Americans would recognize Quantrell sooner than white residents, as white residents had more access to newspapers and other sources of communication. This story seems like an urban legend that could have been passed on from generation to generation. <coughs> Edward Leslie, in his book, The Devil Knows How to Ride, helped dispel some of these myths that Quantrell visited Eudora before the raid. Leslie describes in detail the cautiousness Quantrell employed while planning his raid in Lawrence. Quantel, Quantrell wanted to attack Lawrence above all other communities because of its abolitionist tendencies. It is unlikely that Quantrell would have visited a community so close to Lawrence so soon before the raid for risk of being captured. It's important to note Quantrell was already a wanted man in Kansas at this point. He was very famous. He was very wanted. So it would seem very risky to venture this far into Kansas at that point. All sources indicate that Quantrell and his gang of raiders from Missouri visited the southern stretches of the town, Eudora Township, in their early morning hours of August 21st, 1863, on their way to Lawrence. Quantrell and his men caused bloodshed as they made their way through the township. The raiders sought numerous times to murder civilians or inquire about directions to Lawrence. Quantrell's th journey through the Eudora Township must have triggered confusion, panic, and fear. The first community in the Eudora area that Quantrell visited was Captain's Creek. Captain's Creek was located southeast of Eudora, just over the Johnson County line. Justin Kanabi, one of the early settlers to the community, hid from Quantrell's raiders when they passed through the community. Kanabi was German and had no known abolitionist sympathies. However, it was believed by many, and it proved to be true, that Quantrell and his raiders would target German immigrants during the raids. Therefore, Kanabi was fortunate to survive. <coughs> Quantel and his raiders next stopped in the small community of Hesper. In Hesper, they shot two Union soldiers. One survived and one died. In Hesper, they also searched for August Bromelsick, a Quaker with strong anti-slavery views. 
Bromelsick managed to escape his captors by blowing out the home's only candle and escaping in a cornfield. The last stop Quantrell and his men made before arriving at Lawrence was just south of Eudora at a location we call Keystone Corner. The purpose of this stop at this location was to find and murder Union supporters Joseph Stone and Union Captain H.A. Jennings. Jennings lived at the corner of 1100 Road and 2200 Road. When Quantrell arrived at the Jennings home, Captain Jennings was not there. <clears throat> Joseph Stone was there, however, and he was murdered. Sensing they were close to Lawrence, but unsure of how to proceed, the raiders kidnapped a teenage boy named Jacob Rowe to show them the way to the town. Rowe led them to Lawrence and was allowed to return home unharmed once the raiders started their destruction of Lawrence. The abduction of Jacob Rowe is dramatized in a book written by local historian Rhonda Hassig. Eudora resident Frederick Pillow was one of the first to know about Quantrell's location in the region, according to a letter that he wrote immediately after the raid. Pillow's letter is now on file at the Spencer Research Library at KU. Pillow was traveling from south of Eudora back to his home that night and arrived in Eudora one hour before Quantrell attacked Lawrence. When Pilla arrived in Eudora, he discovered the town was completely unaware of Quantrell's proximity. Therefore, Eudora would have been caught off guard just like Lawrence and would have also suffered catastrophic devastation had he decided to attack Eudora. Once Pilla arrived in Eudora, he told many of his neighbors about Quantrell's proximity and likely intent to raid Lawrence. Some Eudora residents became determined to warn Lawrence of, their eminent, of the imminent threat. Three men set out on horseback to warn Lawrence. One man was thrown from his horse shortly after he left and died because of his injuries. A second man helped the first man, who was obviously in severe pain. And then a third man was thrown from his horse, and he suffered injuries that would plague him for the rest of his life. Thus, no one from Eudora was able to warn Lawrence. One can only speculate how Lawrence might have fared differently had at least one of the men from Eudora reached the town uh, before Quantrell's arrival. The early morning hours of August 21st, 1863, Eudora residents must have seen heavy smoke coming from Lawrence, and they must have known that Lawrence was virtually destroyed. Residents of Eudora prepared to meet Quantrell and his raiders upon the chance they would return to Eudora after leaving Lawrence. In a letter Pillow wrote shortly after the raid, he states that he and other men in Eudora were ready to, quote, receive the devils if they should come back through Eudora. The raiders did not return to Eudora, but instead fled Lawrence on a southern route. In the letter, Pilla describes in graphic detail the tremendous loss of life in Lawrence and in terms of tremendous loss in Lawrence in terms of property and life. He mentions the horrible stench of death hovering over Lawrence because of the dead and bloated bodies lying on the streets under the hot August sun. He notes that 80 Germans were killed in the raid, nearly half of all casualties. Pillow also notes the heavy Union military presence in eastern Kansas in September of 1863 to protect, to protect the region and prevent further raids. Eudora residents were quick to aid Lawrence after the raid, uh, which destroyed nearly the entire city. Soon after the raiders departed, men and women from Eudora rode over to Lawrence to lend what aid they could, and they were among the first to aid the town. Charles Durr, a prominent citizen of Eudora, supplied 16 oxen to deliver thousands of feet of lumber to Lawrence to aid the rebuilding process. There was an incredible demand for lumber in the aftermath of the raid. The nearby town of Franklin was systematically destroyed, uh, and all the lumber was shipped to Lawrence to rebuild the buildings. Franklin was a pro-slavery community. So because, Lawrence, because Eudora was a union town and because they were quick to help, Eudora wasn't uh, subjected to the same fate as Franklin. They spared Eudora, you could say, because of Eudora's help. I think Eudora's efforts to rebuild Lawrence demonstrates the community's commitment to the union cause and to aid other union communities. The Underground Railroad, a network that sought to free slaves, was very active in Douglas <coughs> County before and during the Civil War. However, I have found little to no evidence to connect the town of Eudora to the Underground Railroad. I have researched the topic uh, pretty exhaustively, uh, and I have found no evidence um, so far. I have researched this just because there's a great interest in the topic. It stands to reason that Eudora was not involved in the Underground Railroad because the town as a whole was relatively neutral on slavery. Eudora residents as a whole were not involved in political efforts to end slavery. I've heard several misinformed people claim <coughs> that there are tunnels all over downtown Eudora that were used on the Underground Railroad. This is nonsense. First of all, we've never uncovered any evidence of any tunnels anywhere in downtown Eudora. The popular claim is that a tunnel connects the Pilla store 
to the Caw Valley Bank building at 700 Main Street to the Pilla House. There's no evidence of any of these tunnels. Furthermore, all of those buildings were built well after the end of Civil War, well after the end of the Civil War, well after slavery had been abolished. Therefore, even if there were tunnels, they could not have been used on the Underground Railroad because slavery had already ended. I also remind people that the Underground Railroad was not literally underground, it was mostly above ground. The underground refers to the fact that it was secretive and out of sight. Furthermore, I also have to sometimes remind people that the Underground Railroad was not literally a railroad either. If there, are any, if there is any Eudora community with the connection to the Underground Railroad, it would be Hesper. Hesper was far more political than Eudora, and Hesper was populated by people who held more liberal views on slavery. I have looked through all of the old Hesper documents in our collection, and I came across a vague possible reference to the Underground Railroad. It mentions that the community shelters slaves in one of the, the, in one of the documents. It does not say whether these slaves were freed or if they were on the Underground Railroad, but we do know that Hesper was on the Oregon Trail, and that trail would have been used by the Underground Railroad, and they would have had, abolitionists would have had friends and allies in Hesper, um, you know, if they were needed. The Civil War ended in April of 1865 with the defeat of the Confederacy. The war was devastating, especially in the South. It was the deadliest war in American history. Not long after the war concluded, President Lincoln was assassinated and slavery was finally destroyed and millions of slaves were set free. Of course, the end of slavery did not lead to equality right away. It took 100 years for African Americans to gain the right to vote in the South. And even today, a disturbing amount of racism poisons our society. Many veterans of the Civil War lived in Eudora following the conclusion of the war. In fact, so many Civil War veterans lived in the community that a branch of the Grand Army of the Republic, GAR, was formed in Eudora. The GAR was a national fraternal organization comprised of Union Civil War veterans. The document pictured uh, is the charter uh, document of the Eudora branch of the GAR, which we have on display at the museum. Uh, one Civil War veteran and GAR member that moved to Eudora after the war was John A. Siebold. Siebold was a German immigrant who fought for the Union during the war. He was a tinsmith and he moved to Eudora in 1869 when he purchased a small building on Main Street from a shoemaker named Henry Polk. Over the course of 12 years, Siebold would expand the building dramatically as his business and family grew. The building that Siebold expanded was our current museum building, pictured on, <coughs> pictured on my left there. Um, it is a great source of pride uh, for me and I think for the historical society that the majority of our building was built by a Civil War veteran. Sadly though, even though Siebold survived the deadliest war in American history, he died very young. He died at the age of 39 in 1884 when he fell from a roof that he was tinning. The Civil War is indeed one of the defining events in American history. In fact, it's perhaps the defining event. Therefore, Eudora's connection to the Civil War is incredibly important and relevant. Eudora stands in contrast to other communities in the county because it was not founded for political reasons. However, Eudora is more representative of the typical Kansas community of the 1850s and 60s than any other community in Douglas County. Moderate free state settlers constituted the overwhelming majority of Kansas settlers. Therefore, Eudora as a moderate free state community can be analyzed as indicative of how other Kansas communities were impacted by the events of bleeding Kansas in the Civil War. Bleeding Kansas in the Civil War impacted Eudora in unimaginable capacities and the influence of these events would be felt long after the war had ended. And now I have a, a few Civil War artifacts to show you. Um, our museum's been collecting since 2004 and in that time uh, we've been able to collect some very important artifacts relating to Eudora but we have very few from the Civil War uh, when compared to more recent time periods. Uh, in the first photo uh, the top object there is, was found on a farm in the Eudora Township where the Oregon Trail uh, went through that farm. So one can imagine this item was dropped from a traveler <coughs> on the Oregon Trail. The item is a bayonet that was used by a Union soldier. Uh, we had this bayonet identified by a Civil War expert in Lawrence. He said that smaller bayonets like this were, were bought in the thousands by the Union Army during the Civil War from factories in Prussia. Mostly small bayonets such as this one were used for training purposes. The item on the bottom is an 1864 pistol, which we also had identified, uh, that was found in downtown Eudora. Uh, it perhaps has no connection to the Civil War, but close enough. 
<laughs> this box contains some buttons and badges that belong to the Gerstenberger family. The Gerstenbergers were one of Eudora's more prominent families. The buttons are from a Union <coughs> Army uniform. The medals are GAR medals. And I was told by the donor of the artifacts that the GAR medals were made from melted Confederate cannons, which I think is a, a nice image. Um, and I believe that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Of the man that joined the union. There's John. Do we have we have a list of a lot of the oh, veterans? Have you uh, started the list? Started the list, but uh, we've got people that died during the Civil War, mm -hmm. but the whole list. Oh. I'd like to get one. Yeah, I think it'd be hard to get it. <laughs> I must just, uh, just stunned you with my eloquence <laughs> and entertaining abilities. So, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Please come back in November for our next meeting. So, this one's adjourned. And we're up and running with the laptop. So, Kevin, if you want to buy your tickets, please buy tickets. <laughs>